My name is Aram. I'm the writer and producer of the Dungeon and Dragons podcast, God's Fall. And my name's Dylan. I'm a physicist from Canada. Welcome to Kill, Kill Every, Every Monster. We are a show about every Dungeons and Dragons monster in the manual. In the first part of each episode, we examine the lore and mechanics of those creatures and ask our guests the central question, are they really a monster? In the second half, our guest takes on the role of the creature and acts out some of the ideas we discussed in a one-shot actual play. Conservationist and writer Orla joined us for the pilot episode to talk about banshees and the incredibly personal nature of Irish curses. There's a lot to do with like combing hair. That's a big part of it. Where if someone disrespected her or stole her comb or something like that, then that night the scream would be heard and you'd, someone in the family would be taken. And basically it would go through the whole family and they just get wiped out. Curses in Irish folklore are always punishments. It's not horror movie logic where, you know, the, the, the two that go off to have sex get killed first. It's like, it's normally you've disrespected someone very directly. The county I moved to, Mayo, hasn't won the All-Ireland Football Championship since the last time they won. They were all celebrating on the bus. And this was apparently like, this was like 80 years ago or something. Um, they were on the bus driving. They were in, um, driving back from Dublin where they'd won to Mayo. And they were all a little bit locked on the bus and celebrating because they just won. And there was a funeral and they didn't stop and pay any respects to the funeral. The story was that they would never win the All-Ireland again until every member of that team was dead. And there's only one guy left and they've come second place like eight or nine times. This is a curse that people genuinely 100% believe in. They are waiting for this weird old man to die. Orla helped us introduce our dual format and showed my obstinate woodcutter that he was not welcome in her forest. Just at the edge of what you can perceive, there are shapes. There are five of them. Detect life. A banshee can magically sense the presence of creatures up to five miles away that aren't undead or constructs. She knows the general direction they're in, but not their exact locations. One of them doesn't go around that much. It seems to stand there. And whenever there's a noise, it's gesturing wildly. And there are four of them that seem to be carrying out the work of creating. And incomprehensible racket. The sort of thing you haven't heard since your last few days alive. What do you want to do? <sighs> you haven't even interacted with Aram yet. And yet, I'm prescient that way. Trolls are lord generators, and our guest Gnome had some unique ideas about their origins. Do either of you know how anglerfish mate? For the longest time, we did not know what a male anglerfish was. We could only catch female anglerfish, and we had no idea why. And eventually, we found out that the reason why was because male anglerfish are in the running for the smallest vertebrates on Earth. That there are these tiny little inch-long, you know, barely, barely a fish fish. And female anglerfish are 60 times their size. Male anglerfish will hunt down a female anglerfish by smell, and when finding her, will bite somewhere onto her body and then slowly be absorbed into her body. I love this for trolls because uh, we've got this weird, constantly regenerating, melting into each other kind of body horror. So in my homebrew, in my home setting, trolls, the giant, you know, eight to 12 to 18 foot tall, uh, uh, massive thing, those are female trolls and troll dolls are male trolls almost blind, almost deaf, uh, hunting entirely by smell, will, will hunt through the woods to find a female troll. And when they finally do, they'll leap on her and burrow into her flesh and melt into her. Instead of making them the little like semi-blind, semi like the troll doll, you make them like just clever enough and you make that, that whole murderous, imp which also pulls the trolls closer to Fae, which is where I feel like they should be anyway. But that murderous impulse is like, the legend of the red cap is whenever a troll sees a sufficiently large person and is like, ah, 
a woman and then guts them and tries to tear its way inside. If you're an average person, they'll just pass you by. But if you're some hulking dude, they're 100% going for you. And then they're left standing in a pile of viscera, baffled that they haven't been absorbed. Why romance no work? Why must be bad at love? I'll go on Reddit now. <laughs> Our AP adventure played out like an old Norse fable, complete with a classic game of smashy catch. You know enough to brace yourself and you take it like a champ. It shatters, it cracks down the middle. There's like little bits of shale now scattered sort of around you. And you look up and there is this troll standing there. Uh, do you continue marching forward after you threw this, or is this like throw it and see how it goes? I, I think Gondak uh, threw the rock, and now he's shouting down in giant from the from the, the top of that hill. Next one, not warning shot. Those Gondak goats. Gondak king, king of goats. <laughs> and Aram, you speak giant, so you get all of that. I'd crack my shoulders, place a hand to my chest and heal those nine points of damage and might raise my other hand in the air and in giant. Hello there, friend. I am not here to fight. I am here to speak with you. The werewolf episode was a personal one for our friend Dylan. A good werewolf story has a more inner conflict. It's the conflict between some parts of yourself that you don't like or maybe wish that you didn't have to deal with and the parts of you that are easier. I think the best werewolf stories tell a story where the werewolf has to not beat that thing, but become harmonized with it and find a balance between those two sides of themselves and learn to be happy and cohesive with it. Dylan's episode was a reminder that humanizing monsters often means battling our own assumptions about them. And sometimes, as my drow werewolf hunter would discover, it means not fighting at all. You two spend a decent evening. Like the sun was starting to get low. It was starting to get dark, but it hadn't set yet. And basically up till near actual like sunset just a nice peaceful walk a little conversation talk about the drow homelands from the day my neck was strong enough to hold up my head it was a constant fight to keep the two of them attached she's riveted she's just like oh, oh my god and how did you survive at seven years old i slayed my first cave monster <gasps> oh my gosh so was there any, like, one thing that, like, really changed you? Like, you know, like, one moment that totally changed the course of your life forever? Like a big thing that came out of nowhere? As you would say that, like, it's been a relatively cloudy evening. And as we're walking along this path, there's we come to a clearing. And as we do, the clouds part in front of us and the silvery orb of the moon slides out and just bathes us in this silvery light. And I would stop for a moment and I would look up and I would genuinely smile and I would nod and just say yes and keep walking. Michael came with a love for his so-called basketball-headed children and a Looney Tunes interpretation of goblin mischief. The the way I do goblin technology is they're they're sort of natural born tinkers, but all goblin technology essentially requires the expenditure of goblin lives to achieve and typically will only work the once. So they can they can build anything, but it will fail spectacularly when it accomplishes whatever its task was, and at least one goblin will die in the process. And they all just kind of accept that as as part of th the system. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Goblins are designed to be encountered as a group. Michael tracked his with a dozen index cards as they overwhelmed my dwarven brewmaster. The two goblins that are still hidden, they do not recognize that they were not seen. 
the remaining five goblins in the room, what do they want to do as Rumble is held in this barrel? Our goal here is to steal some booze. Therefore, at this point, several kegs are just going to like sprout legs and start running out of the room at maximum goblin speed, a whopping 30 feet. The second that Fivik saw that, he would immediately let go of Rumble and go to try to stop the barrels from leaving. Which means we're going into initiative. Aram, cut, cut around this, because this is going to be a couple of minutes. So then, Orla, is the Banshee a monster? Your idea is you're creating a monster because you're creating a monster manual. So you're looking to folklore for things that may or may not be monsters, but are at least scary. The Banshee is definitely something that people fear. Do you think the werewolf is a monster? I, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense for a creature that as far as most lore is concerned, is a full human for a vast majority of its existence and spends one day as a, you know, as this alternative form. Like, I think that the assumption that the entire person is corrupted and is monstrous because of that seems silly. <laughs> I think we can all agree they're monsters, but is the troll a monster? They're monsters, but only to the extent that people are. Um, I read trolls as very much, they are excess. So they are ravenous hunger, ravenous thirst. You know, that's that's straight out of the monster manual too, that they're driven by those kinds of hungers. Um, they are greed and they are stupidity and they are uh, all of these things that make monsters out of people are present in certain depictions of troll. Goblins in 5th edition are generally kind of written to be murdered and not even in a way that's like particularly motivated, right? Like the hag, which we'll talk about later, plays off of a lot of really unfortunate anti-Semitic and misogynist tropes. And there's the vampire that has a whole bunch of like horror baked into it to make you want to fight these things. Goblins are just built to be worthless little shits but they're my worthless little shits. And that's why I love them. And these are just some of the creatures we feature in season one of Kill Every Monster. You can find information about us, where you can listen to and support the show, and how you can be a part of future episodes at killeverymonster.com. So join us for a DM deep dive to kill, kill every, every monster. monster.